So it's really mind blowing that the SpaceX team has been able to catch the largest flying object ever made multiple times using a very novel method of catching it out of the air with giant chopsticks. I mean, have you ever seen that before? Yeah, congrats again. That was an incredible achievement. So the, 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 the reason we are uh, catching it in this way, which has uh, never been done before, is in order to achieve the rapidly reusable portion of the, in order to make the rocket rapidly reusable. So if it is, if, 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 the, if the super heavy booster which is gigantic, uh, it's like 30 feet in diameter. Um, if, if it were to land with landing legs on a landing pad, we would then have to uh, pick it up, uh, stow the legs, uh, and put it back in the launch pad. Um, and that's uh, it's quite difficult to transport such a large thing. Um, but if we catch it with the same tower that it's used to put it in the uh, launch uh, mount to begin with, that, that is the best case outcome for rapid reuse. So it literally gets caught uh, by the same arms that placed it in the launch, uh, in the launch ring, and then uh, it is placed back in the launch ring immediately. So in principle, the super heavy booster can be reflown within an hour of uh, landing. So it, it, it comes back in about five or six minutes, one way or another, and, and then it, it gets caught by the tower arms, placed back in the launch mount, and then you can re refill for propellant in about 30 to 40 minutes and, and place a ship on top of it and, in principle, refly the entire booster uh, every hour. Maybe every two hours to be, give it a little bit of extra time. Um, but let's just say it's, it's, very, it, it, it's in the limit of rapid reuse. And then we, the next thing we need to do is, is catch the ship, too. So we haven't done this yet, but we will. So that's what we hope to demonstrate later this year, maybe as soon as two or three months from now. And then the, the ship would be placed on top of the booster and re then again uh, re re refilled with propellant and flown again. Um, with the ship, uh, it takes a bit longer because it's got to orbit Earth a few times until the ground track comes back over the launch pad. Uh, but it, it, the ship is also intended to be reflown multiple times per day. So this is the, uh, the new Raptor 3, which is an, an awesome engine. Big hand to the Raptor team for this. This is very exciting. So Raptor 3 uh, is designed to require no basic heat shield, uh, saving a lot of mass on the bottom and actually improving reliability so that uh, if, if there is, for example, um, a small fuel leak uh, from the Raptor engine, uh, it will simply leak uh, into the existing flaming plasma and um, not really matter. Whereas uh, a fuel leak 
when the engines are contained in a box uh, is a very scary thing indeed. So this is a Raptor 3. Uh, might, it'll, it'll take it probably a few kicks at the can, but it will be is a massive in increase uh, in payload capability, uh, in engine efficiency, uh, and in reliability. So this is really a revolutionary engine. Um, you know, Raptor 3 is really, I'd say, kind of alien technology rocket engine. I mean, even industry experts, when we showed a picture of the Raptor 3, said that engine is not complete. So then we said, well, here's the engine not complete, firing uh, at a level of efficiency that has never been achieved before. So. I mean, that is one clean engine. So in order to make the engine like that, we had to simplify so many parts of the design, incorporate uh, secondary fluid circuits and electronics in the structure of the engine itself. Uh, so everything is contained and protected. Uh, it is uh, a marvel of engineering, frankly. Then one of the other technologies that's key for Mars is, is uh, doing orbital propellant transfer. So you can think of this like similar to aerial refueling for airplanes, uh, but in this case it's orbital refilling of rockets, which has never been done before. Uh, but it is, you know, technically feasible. Um, I always feel like these things are a little NSFW, <laughs> sort of. Listen, you've got to transfer fluid somehow. There's no, this has got to be done. So uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the two starships would get together, and one starship would transfer fuel and oxygen. And actually, most of the mass is oxygen. It's almost 80% oxygen that gets transferred, um, a little over 20% fuel. and. Um, and so once you, you, so you send a starship to orbit with, uh, that's full of payload, and then you send a, a bunch of other starships up, and you would refill the propellant on that starship. And once the, uh, the propellant tanks are mostly full, then you can depart for the Mars, for Mars or the moon or, yeah. So this is an important technology, which uh, we should hopefully uh, demonstrate next year. So. So then with the, uh, one of the toughest problems to solve is the uh, reusable heat shield. Um, so so no, no one has ever developed a truly reusable orbital heat shield. So the, the, it's extremely difficult to do so. Um, even the, the shuttle, shuttle's heat shield required several months of refurbishment, basically fixing broken tiles, um, testing each tile, and um, because it's an extremely hard problem uh, to, to be able to withstand the extreme heat and pressure of reentry. Um, and uh, the only things that, that can really withstand this level of heat are uh, advanced sort of ceramics, uh, kind of, uh, you know, basically glass, alumina, uh, some types of, of uh, carbon carbon. But very, very little actually can survive the uh, and, and with with reusability without getting er, without eroding um, or falling off or cracking uh, can survive the stresses of reentry. Uh, so this will be the first time uh, that it's done that 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 a reusable orbital heat shield is developed, um, and it needs to be obviously extremely reliable. Um, so. This will, this will be something they'll be working on for a few years, I think, to, to keep honing the, the heat shield. Um, it's, it's a very, it's, it's, it is an achievable thing, so we're not trying to do something that isn't achievable. It is within the realm of physics to get this done, just an extraordinarily difficult thing to get done. And Mars, uh, the Mars atmosphere is carbon dioxide, which at first may seem better, but actually it ends up being worse because it, it, when the CO2 turns into a plasma, 
and you've got, you actually end up with more free oxygen entering on a Mars atmosphere than on Earth atmosphere. So Earth's atmosphere is only around 20% um, oxygen, and uh, Mars ends up being basically more than double that, maybe triple that, um, when you consider, when the, the CO2 becomes a plasma and, uh, and, you, and you get uh, carbon and, and O2. So the, that, that wants to oxidize the heat shield, basically burn the heat shield. So that's why we, uh, we, we tested very rigor rigorously in a CO2 atmosphere, because it's got to work not just for Earth, but also for Mars. Um, and and we, we, want to, we want to use the same heat shield for Earth that we use for Mars, because there are many other factors with the heat shield uh, such as making sure the tiles don't crack or fall off or anything like that. Um, so we want to have the same heat shield structure, same material on Earth as on Mars, so we can test it uh, hundreds of times on Earth before going to Mars and be confident that when it goes to Mars, it will work. <laughs> 